Never knew what I wanted till I met you. This chat I had with Paul Clayton really confirmed again what I know, that as actors and creatives, we are so responsible for our own careers, for our own sanity, and having respect for what we do. He's had a huge career. He was in Ali G in the House, Peep Show, Coronation Street. He's currently in Hollyoaks, four years the RSC, him and her. He's also got his own corporate acting company and does a huge amount of that work and is chairman of the Actors' Centre. So this really covers everything from how to walk into a room, knowing who you are, and also understanding you can have times where you do are resting, but as he said, it's not resting, it's fighting to stay alive. So, enjoy. Oh, hello. Let me tell you. Oh, there we go. Very good. <laughs> Rocking out. <laughs> Hi, this is Marisha Trembetska. We love your creativity. And today I have Paul Clayton, the actor, who's Dulcet Tones, you've already heard. Hello, Paul. Hi, nice to see you. Again. I know. I know. I know. Paul Clayton's kind of been in my, it feels like in my life for a long time, not just <laughs> in terms of obviously seeing your work on many, many tele- fantastic television shows, but also your chair of the Actors Centre, which I'm a member of, and I've even done your So You Want to Be a Corporate Actor course. And of course, recently we did a little film together. So yeah, which was good fun, wasn't it? Yes, and I felt, I mean, I even wrote a blog post about it. I really felt I learned quite a lot from you about at some point knowing when to say, not in any weird way, but to say in the room, if things aren't working to the best of the actors and you can't do the best to be able to say to the director or whatever else, you know, maybe you need to think about this on this and this. It made me think about taking my own space as an actor a bit mm. more when I'm on a set. But then it's because I, I guess you've done a ridiculous amount of television, haven't you? So I think I have, and I think it's also part of coming to know yourself as a person and what you settle for. I think quite often... As actors, we're in a position of feeling grateful that we've got the work, grateful that we've got the interview, and we settle for things that possibly we might not settle for in other areas of our lives. Um, I went to a casting on Friday for a commercial, which I was asked to do, and I rarely do them these days. Um, That's not me being grand. It's just that I think since all the rates changed and agents send you up for fewer because most agencies are trying to pay less than the going rate, Uh, And I had a timed appointment, and I was a good boy, and I uh, arrived ten minutes early to fill out all the paperwork, and, of course, the script at the interview wasn't the one I'd been sent, so there was a new script. Uh, But it was all reasonably chaotic, with a director arriving late and whatever, and the person at the desk at this particular casting studio had just decided to then start letting actors go in in the order they arrived. Um, So there were people going, oh, my appointment's 3.40, mine's 3.50, and again, you'll be next week, and I said... So I, I just put my hand up and said, I'm really sorry, I have an appointment at 3.10. And he went, yeah, but we're doing it in... And I said, well, what was the point of me having an appointment? Uh, and he got very ratty. Uh, I suppose the last thing he needed um, <laughs> was uh, a whole group of men pretending to be butlers. We'd all been asked, obviously because of the limited um, imagination of the casting people, we'd all been asked to wear a white shirt, black tie and dark jacket. Uh, but I suppose the last thing he needed was, uh, a, I'm told the collective now for bottlers is a sneer of bottlers, which I love. <laughs> uh, so I think the last thing this boy needed was a sneer of bottlers on Sneering. Friday afternoon. Um, but I just thought, this is a business appointment. I was given a business appointment at 3.10, and I have arranged my afternoon around it. And I have another appointment at 4 o'clock at my dentist, and... I have another appointment with a friend at 4.45, and I've booked out my day. So while I am aware that there is a lateness of um, running commercial castings, and indeed lots of castings, uh, to suddenly find that the lateness was being caused because everybody was being put in in some random lottery order. And so when I got in there, I mentioned it to the casting director, and she was appalled. And She said, well, I haven't asked them to do that. I've told them twice. I just think there's that thing that occasionally we get a little walked over. And we don't want to appear difficult because we don't want anybody to say, don't work with him because he's very difficult. Um, But I think it's a matter of professionalism. And I think sometimes we are the ones at the bottom of the heap. And I know particularly in the instance of doing that film with you, and it was a very long day shooting. But when when you sat for two hours waiting while a set has been dressed and lit. So every other department has had their time to do it. And then you come 
on and are asked to do your stuff, as indeed we were. And um, they go, oh yeah, no, we'll do that quickly. Okay, and you, and you think, hang on, no, w- we need to think about what we're doing here. Um, because I don't think audiences look at the screen and go, oh, I'm loving that set dressing, but the acting's terrible. They just look at it and go, oh, it's terrible because of the acting. So it, it's a fine line. You don't want to be difficult, but I also think you, you, you want to take your own reputation. And so I try and be pleasant about it, uh, and I try and be nice about it wherever I can. Uh, I don't think I always succeed. Um, but you see, I come from Yorkshire, so um, I can't even spell tact, let alone do it. <laughs> no, it's like... <laughs> But what I, one of the things I have noticed, and I guess so much with what other classes here at the Actors Centre, is there is this truth that acting is a business, and this sort of cross, uh, and there's a bit in your, I was rereading your So You Want to Be a Corporate Actor book, where you say, actors often have very little choice in their career, they often have to wait at the will of others for decisions to be made that will affect their future. Um, and, and you're saying, but so, so working as best you can in other areas, for example, corporate acting work, kind of gives you some sense of control. I mean, what do you feel is the best way for an actor to have control of their career? Because as you say, you're, you're standing there waiting while people are messing you around, or you don't, you get to the last two or something, which could change your career, and then you don't get it. And how, how have you dealt with that kind of... Um. I think I'm quite resigned about it now because I think there comes a stage in your life where, and this is probably to do with you developing as a person, and perhaps there were elements of me that were, were was a late developer. Um, certainly in relationship terms, you know, I didn't really settle down with anybody until I was nearly 40. Uh, and that did coincide, I think, with an awareness of who and what you are as a person. And I know that as a young actor, I would walk into a room and I, had, I, I didn't have confidence problems. I might have been nervous, but I don't think that would necessarily come across. But I would go into the room thinking, I know I'm a very good actor. What would you like me to be? Um, and I don't think that works. I think you have to go in there saying, this is what I am. Would you like it? And I am the best Paul Clayton there is. Um, I think there'll be some people breathing a sigh of relief that I'm the only Paul Clayton there is. Um, But I'm not bothered if you don't want Paul Clayton. Obviously, there are some things that I would love to do, but that I am not right for. So it's not that I'm not good, it's that I'm not right. And, you know, last week I was waiting for a voiceover, and I don't know what it was, and my agent went, are you free on this day? It's a really big one, it's a really nice one, I didn't know what it was. And then on Thursday morning, there they've gone the other way. So... I don't know what it was. They've gone the other way because something they heard in that person's voice made them make that choice. Um, because what, what wins people over is you, the person. Um, that's what we bring to acting. And I know some people mistake this with typecasting, but you bring a unique brand to your work that is you. And... Possibly a lot of our life is finding out who we are, and then when we settle into a knowledge of that, we sort of know what we're selling, really. Yes, I found that since I've become kind of gone into that old, slightly older age uh-huh. group, I know I play yummy mummies really well or okay. crazy strong women. Brilliant. And occasionally, as with occasionally, the yummy mummies are crazy. So already this year, as indeed they were when you were married to me. Exactly. When I was married to you, Paul, it was a lovely experience. I was crazy, and then two weeks later, I was being alcoholic, crazy y- yummy mummy. Probably as a result of being married to me. <laughs> exactly. But it's interesting that suddenly the works come much. Suddenly there is a constant supply because people can. It's almost like, and they're kind of. Is it typecasting? I don't. I don't know. But there's these two clear counts that I seem to fall in now, and I'm. I, I think that's it. Somebody joked with me. Uh, a very good friend of mine was talking to my partner on the train into work one day, and he said the thing about Paul, he's made a career out of being either stern or camp. Um, I, I'm sure at some points so I've done the two together. Um, <laughs> I always joke that I've made a career out of being posh or northern, and on a really good day, I've done posh northern. (laughs) But I think there is truth in that merriment. I think there is the more you signal it down and people know what they're looking at you for. And I know when I 
I know when I did Peep Show, um, which is, what, seven years ago now and I joined Peep Show, but that just opened up, because oh, it was really identifiable, obviously it's brilliant writing by Sam Bain and, um, uh, and Jesse Armstrong, and, but I think it's allowed people to watch that, to identify a type whether or not that is me, but there are certainly elements of me in, in Ian in Peep Show, and then to know what to get you in for. So that, you know, so then I did go up for lots of dads in, in sitcoms and, and grumpy dads and things. Um, but it, it gets you into the door. It gets you through the door. Uh, and I think that was that was interesting. When I was in my very, very first job, a lovely, lovely actress called Dillis Hamlet, who's not with us anymore, and she had her name above the title in this production of Winter's Tale in, in Manchester. And on her first day of rehearsal, she came to me at the uh, interval of the read-through. She was incredibly glamorous. And um, she said, oh, we read that beautifully, darling. And I thought, well, obviously I did. You know, I've left drama school. I'm the next best thing to slice bread. And uh, I went, oh, thank you very much. And she said, yes, do you know, when you're 40, you'll never stop. <laughs> and how old were you then? I was 21. And I was thinking, and I thought for the first moment, I thought, oh, brilliant. And I thought, oh, hang on, um, that's 19 years to fill. And actually, you know, I did work, and I did some really good work, but she was right. And when I hit 40, I suddenly got into what I do. I achieved my own weight, you know, because at drama school I used to play all the older roles, so and some of the best roles, you know, which was brilliant, but I always played the older people. Um, and I hit 40, and then when I hit 50, I, which I think was the same time as I was doing Peep Show, uh, brilliant. And it's just gone up and up, and I've been incredibly lucky, but um, uh, there's been a waiting time to get there. Well, that's good news for all of us, I think. Uh, and, you know, I think I felt that myself easing and establishing who you are. How much have you done in terms of proactively trying to open doors? Have you left a, a lot to your agent, or have you kind of waited for those moments which have brought you out, like the peep show moment? I had a wonderful tutor at drama school, and he had been a big hope himself in 1956 at Stratford, and it was him and Ian Holm. And for Ian Holm, it all happened, and for this lovely man called John McGregor, it didn't. And he was married to a very successful producer who was head of drama at, at Granada in Manchester when I was there. And he taught, and he taught as the best class of the week um, on Friday mornings, which was called Presentation Technique. Uh, and it was all about things like answering the telephone. So he'd say, you have to pick up that telephone, there's a Peter Hall's on it offering you a job. And uh, all you have to, and he taught us things about broken actions and double takes, and it was brilliant. And I absolutely loved it. And pardon me, I still do a little of that uh, with people here at the Actors Centre sometimes, because I don't think we spend a lot of time on technique. But he had a saying which was every day do one thing that may result in work and then get on with being who you are. Because who you are is what will get you the work. And I know, having directed a lot in my 30s for a lot of rep companies, so sitting on the other side of the table and having whole days of people coming in, you can see desperation. You can, you can smell it. And it's not nice. You have that job. You have the job until you open the door. Oh. And then when you step in the room most of what you're doing is taking you away from the job, unless you're careful. So it's working about what you need, you know, you don't need to, if you go in and think, I've got to shine in there, if you're not shining outside, you know, you're not going to do it. And directors ask really lazy questions, like, you know, what have you been doing recently? And, and sometimes actors don't plan that answer. You know, if this, if this were a job interview in another field, you'd have planned the answers and you'd have thought about the answers. Not rehearse them, but plan them. Actors don't do that. And so, what have you been doing recently? The actor doesn't pick something out that um, enhances who they are and enhances the encounter. They'll normally go, oh, well, um, actually, I've just done... Uh, and they're a bit ashamed of it because it's not been something brilliant and they keep it quite quiet. Rather than saying, I mean, I remember I got a job once in um, that set of films, The Queen, and I ended up playing Bernard Ingham. And I went in, and 
I had literally just come back from holiday, and the director went, so what have you been up to recently? And I went, oh, we've just come back from the Maldives. God, it was fantastic. Um, and I think that, and the casting director, uh, who was lovely, at the end of it, when I'd rhapsodied about the Maldives for three minutes, she went, I think he might have meant work. And the director went, no, no, no. He said, I think I'm going to book for the Maldives. Uh, and I got the job. Because um, I think what it allowed me to do was I was talking about something I was passionate about, not not trying to buff up something that I'd just done and trying to make it sound really good or, you know, go, uh, I've been doing... You know, I mean, I like actors who kiss I've not done anything for the last six months. I've found it really hard to get a job. But I have been doing plumbing. I've been in people's house and I've met some real loonies. And then you're going to, oh, really? Tell me tell me what them... Well, you know. And then you, you the personality involves. Rather than seeing somebody who's dripped away and a little bit of a faded version of themselves, you see somebody in the room who's living and breathing. So I try and do that. Um, I email. I tweet now. Um, mm-hmm. I always used to write lots of letters. Um... But that's been my maxim, do one thing and then... And, you know, I've been there, I've had, um, I've had weeks of 27 interesting ways with a baked potato. Um, and, of course, nowadays there isn't the support uh, for young actors uh, and the luxury that we had in that we could sign on the dole, no questions asked, and if you could live on the dole, then you weren't pestered. Whereas now, you know, six months away and, well, have you thought about retraining and... Uh, And one of the things I'm really, really keen on here at the Actors Centre is we provide a haven for young people not to just develop, because um, I don't know whether continuous professional development is for everybody, but I think I want to provide a place to enable people to sustain themselves until their time is right, you know. I think in the modern world now, uh, and with the other things I do and the corporate stuff and whatever, if it all be 20 years later, I might not have made it to 40 as an actor. Um, I was just lucky that I really probably can't do anything else, and that there was enough to t- keep me ticking over until things, you know, the blue touch paper lit. Um, I think the awful thing now is that sometimes there isn't enough around for people and they have to go and do other things like being on the checkout in a supermarket or and things that demand their time and, and let them wither away. And perhaps by being a member here, um, it sounds like an advert, but it's not, but perhaps by coming here once a week, twice a week, whether you do a workshop, whether you just come in for a cup of coffee, whether you just come in to check what's on, that's your bit of being an actor. You are an actor while you do that. Yes, and indeed, as I said before we started, I did a workshop here on Saturday afternoon on the art of being an idiot, and I, because I always liked this idea of going to Lecoq in Paris and doing. Do you know, I'm quite fond of Lecoq. <laughs> I don't <laughs> so think that, I that might not anyway. come as a revelation to any of your listeners. <laughs> I don't think it comes as a revelation of my listeners <laughs> either, to be honest. But I always had this fantasy, but I've never wanted to wear a clown. But yeah. every actor I've ever met who's been there always has an incredibly interesting take, and I did come away really as I said, inspired, and then I took what I learned from that workshop, because I don't do acting class anymore, because I've kind of figured out... But I don't know whether you can... I don't know whether you can do acting class in the sense of... I don't think you can learn acting. That's Mm -hmm. my bottom line. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. You can either do it or you can't. Mm -hmm. But you can finesse it. For example, the stuff about the comedy, which I'm doing a workshop um, in Leicester at the Curve um, on Saturday for the Actors Centre... And I do it every year with the Alan Bates Bursary, which we're running at the moment this year. Uh, And I do a 90-minute thing about comedy to test people's ability to adopt technique. Comedy has to be more truthful than anything else. You can get away with it in tragedy. You can wail and moan. And comedy has to be absolutely down the line and, and, and incredibly truthful. But having got that truth, there are then techniques... Um that you can add on to it, that can enhance it, and indeed take it to phenomenal heights. I went yesterday afternoon to um, to see Two Into One, the Ray Cooney farce at the, at the Chocolate Factory, and I saw it years ago, Donald Sinden and Michael uh, Williams in the 80s. 
and there are some performances in the chocolate factory that are just superb. And they're doing amazingly stupid things, and we were weeping with laughter, which on a Sunday matinee at 3.30 is quite an achievement. Um, but there was never for one moment did you go, like, now, you see, I just don't, be I don't believe that. But they managed to, because they were playing the truth, but then phenomenal pieces of business involving doors and... Uh, looks and timing and things that were just superb and a joy to watch and and in a way that thing that only theatre can give you you know we that beautiful contract that theatre is that the audience say we're going to let you do that as long as you don't really test our patience and that's a joy and it's a privilege to be given that that, that allowance by an audience um, so uh, you know to do that here and to add on things to what you do. I, you see, I always say I don't think I've ever needed training. I think I'm probably beyond redemption. I do what I do. And the mm. idea of coming and doing a class about anything or a workshop, as we now call it, has never intrigued me. But I have to say, when I'm in the building and I watch workshops going on and I, I popped in on some, I am quite fascinated by them. And, um, and the people I meet here when I do do workshops... And I tend to concentrate on the business area that you were talking about. So I think the last one I did was called Making the Meeting Work, which is about the interview and about not being passive and making it into an interaction and a conversation rather than just answering questions, what did you, what have you been up to, and, and doing your piece or whatever. Um, but I am f thrilled by some of the people I meet here. And... Um, it's been brilliant as chairman to get to know some people, and, and in some cases I've been able to help some people and point them in the right direction. Um, and I've been mentoring the Alan Bates winners for the last two years, who are two fantastic young actors who I am honoured. Uh, I'm honoured now to call them friends. Um, Elliot Barnes-Worrell, who, who's currently at the RSC, and Adam Buchanan, who's just finished playing the lead in a play at Hampstead, and he's now going through his first period of resting, uh, <laughs> unemployment. I hate that word, resting. Well, the thing is, you're, you're not, are you? You know. You're emailing, you're calling, yeah. you're, you're keeping your contacts, you're... You're, you're working resting. harder. Yeah. Than you're, you're, the, you're not resting, you're fighting to stay alive. Yes. Um, but he's uh, coming to the end of two weeks. He's a very talented actor and something will happen, but when you've not done it, two... He's been very lucky, so two weeks is a, is a long time. I, I took him... <laughs> I took him to see I Can't Sing the other night at the oh, Palladium. How is that? And, uh, it, it's, um, it's an experience. Okay. <laughs> and, um, but we had a great night that he was just doing that thing, and I recognised myself in it that, you know... I, I mean, I don't last two weeks now. I love my first day of unemployment. I adore it. I don't change out of my pyjamas. I'll get my desk clear, sorted, I'll, you know, and then get some custard creams and pointless in the late afternoon... Uh, the second day, I'll get a bit itchy, so I might pop out for lunch. The third day, I will be clawing the walls, because I know I'll never work again. <laughs> and i become unbearable to live with. Yeah, I can imagine. <laughs> <laughs> Thank God it wasn't a real marriage. Absolutely. <laughs> so can I talk briefly about your... So obviously you've written a book about being a corporate actor. Because you... Which I know, I know, I know, obviously, this is something I pre-bought. So I might get to sign it. Fab, no, it's so, so well. Um, so when did you start really getting into corporate acting? Was it very much a case of, okay, I am clawing the walls, no one's giving me work, I'd better go and do something to get some money in? Well, actually, it's interesting. Um, I don't think I realised there was a corporate sector, and, and, and like a lot of people are acting me, asking me from the title of the book, what is a corporate actor? Uh, and the answer to that question is one who earns money and doesn't have to live on baked potatoes. Um, I directed a lot uh, in the 90s, and I wanted to be a theatre director. I wanted to certainly try it. And because people pigeonhole you in this country, I did one production, and I was offered another, and then people started saying to me, like, oh, you've given it up now, haven't you? You just direct. And I said, no, I haven't given it up. I just direct. So between my directing jobs, which took three months to set up each production for various different theatres, um, I found myself doing... I think I started doing medical role play, and that was a recommendation of a friend who, a friend had a company, an actress called Debbie Manship has a company called Roll Call, and they're still going, and, and they are one of the best, but they're very small, uh, and I met her, and then she sent me on a, 
uh, a job where I was a patient with a senior oncologist and it was about the conversation that he had to tell you you've got cancer. Uh, and it was a sort of revelatory for me because I did that and I did a few more. I was a terrible actor on television, uh, theatre trained. I think we did four days of television training in my three years at Manchester Poly. Uh, and then lots of big theatres, the Royal Exchange, York Theatre Royal, four years at Stratford and the Barbican. I was big, you know, and I thought that you basically did that on television and they pointed a camera at you. Uh, and I didn't understand how suddenly you forget the awareness of, of the outside and it's all for the person you're with. Yet when you're having a conversation with a real doctor, and although there were six other people in the room, look at this, and, and they're talking to you about a disease that you haven't, and it's absolutely fictional, but because you, there's something about you know they're not acting. You related to them at a level, uh, and I thought, God, perhaps this is what television's like, that you don't have to throw it out. You just absolutely focus on the person you're with. And it did, undoubtedly, make me a much better TV actor. Um, but suddenly I found there was a lot of work, and about the same time I met a lovely corporate agent who who found actors for events and things and she put me into things and quite often you'd arrive and there was no director there was no they hadn't you know thought about such earth shattering questions like where do you come on from <laughs> oh just miraculously in the middle of the abbey national conference you will be on the stage alas no um so then she would sell me and she said, well, in, in his other, with his other hat on Paul's a theatre director so why doesn't he direct the actors in this conference for you uh, and then I got a reputation with a lot of live event production companies that that's what I did. And then they would ring up and go, well, we don't actually need a 42-year-old slightly portly Yorkshireman in this pool, but we wondered if you knew any 28-year-old city banker types. So I, I got into to helping other actors do it. And um, I like it because it's fast. Uh, the events are nearly always one-off. Uh, I'm not uh, somebody who's ever really comfortable with a long run. Um, I like it the fact that decisions have to be made quite quickly, and as an, as an actor you have to be very, very adaptable. Uh, it's got its share of idiots in it, you know, people who are frightened of taking decisions because of people higher up. And you find that a lot of the corporate world is based on what I call the hierarchy of fear, so you say, shall I say this? And then somebody will not say yes or no, because if they've said yes or no, and the person above them in the chain of the command says, well, they should be saying yes or no, uh, they're frightened of getting into trouble, so they won't commit, which can be frustrating. But it's a fruitful market. It's a brilliant market. It gives you lots of opportunities to do different things. Last night I read beautifully written testimonials for... Uh, the 60th birthday party of the 48th richest man in the world oh. um, <laughs> in a club in Barclay Square oh. for, in between courses of dinner. I um, you had well fed, you were well fed probably as well, weren't um, you? They sent up a nice steak and chips, but I have to say it took its time arriving. But, you know, it was, we, 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 had a, we went to see, as I said, a matinee at theatre yesterday and then my partner headed home to go and watch the Grand Prix and I toppled off in my evening suit to go and work for three hours, oh. but that means I don't really have to work for the rest of this month. And it's a way, I suppose, of giving you a little bit of freedom. Yes, which is actually what your book talks about. And I've, I think also I've really been looking at my career now, because this is what I do, I'm an actor. And sometimes I think, well, I'm an actor, which means I've realised I'm a freelancer. So it's constantly about that freelance work and getting keeping the kitty quite high and not letting it drop and keep, and the little jobs will yeah. help support everything really and I think the more since I've got my head on I'm a freelancer that is what I do and it's increasingly um, the the life force and national treasure that is Anita Dobson mm. uh, has recently joined the board um, of the centre at uh, my invitation and she says that you know she never used to call herself an actress until the first year when she earned enough money that she didn't do any other jobs, and that was you know, quite late. Um, and I think that's you know an interesting proposition. I think we had an event here called Moving On Up for all the graduates who are leaving this year, uh, and we had accountants and um, people who manage event companies who use flash mobs and things to just open up 
the graduates' eyes that you there's going to become a day, and I've named it the day the acting stops. And they're all going to have that day this year. And they've had acting every day for three years. And they've woken up and they haven't had to go out and buy any acting. They haven't had to get acting from their friends. It's just been there. Walk into college, bit of acting. And yet there's going to be a day when, unless they do something and get off their arses, they won't ever act again. And the only way they're going to do that is by creating business relationships with lots of people, which may or may not include an agent. But if they get an agent, that's not an excuse to turn off all the other valves. Um, and they're going to need a business plan. I spoke to a group of lovely, lovely third-year graduates um, at Alra recently. And I said, OK, so if I come back in a year's time and have a conversation with you, how will you know whether you've been successful? And they went, well, if I've worked. And I went, but what, uh, if you've done one day on doctors, will that be success? Or if you've done five days on Poirot, except Poirot's ended, or if you've made a major Hollywood movie, or you've had a week at the Edinburgh Fringe profit share, or you've done a West End run, what is? Um, and they'd never really thought about it. And I think it's that thing of, you know, it would be nice to think that every graduate within their first year um, of employment is going to play a Hollywood lead. And that's a dream. And every graduate should have it. I've still got it as a dream. But it's a dream. It's not an objective. And that means at the end of the year, if that's what your dream is and you haven't relieved it, you're going to have a certain sense of emptiness. Whereas your objective, quite reasonably, could be to do two paid days in front of the camera, one project, and you can be unspecific on that if you want, and to earn, let's say, £5,000, £6,000 from acting and associated activities so we could cover the corporate market. Now that can be the basis of a business plan. And that can be something that's on paper that you can refer to. So three months' time, you can look and see how you're doing. But if you just set off into this void that is the big wide world and you know you're the best thing in it, of course you are, because you just come out of drama school. I was exactly the same. Um, four months down the line, it's going to be really difficult to specify how you're doing. Because you may be unemployed, but you may actually not be doing badly. Because you might have met lots of people and, and you might be more known, but you still might not have had a job. So I think it's really important and increasingly these days that actors think about the business that they are themselves uh, and begin to take that on board. And I am curating the final season of this year at the Actor Centre. We have a, a partner with whom we work. Each time we've had Channel 4, the English Touring Theatre Company, the Monobox... Uh, and I've been asked as, as chairman to um, to do the last season this year, which is going to be a season called The Working Actor, which is going to be all about the business Fantastic. of being an actor mm. and yeah. all those things. Oh. Yeah, no, that's well, yeah. I can't uh, disagree. I'm sure because I've got a corporate background, business background yeah, myself. Yeah, I think so. It makes... But I you're incredibly organised and you, you appreciate placing different aspects of your career and investing time in it and, and focus. I mean, you know, from, from working with you, but from knowing you just a little bit, I know that's the case. And I do meet other people who I think, well, actually, it sort of really doesn't matter whether you're talented or not. I mean, I'm going to assume that all the graduates I saw are remarkably talented and nobody would ever be able to say they can't act. Uh, so therefore it's all down to what they do and how they interact with people that will make them successful. And sometimes it's, it's, about, it's not about can you act, it's about can you interact. Mm -hmm. Yeah, with each other. I mean, I did, a, I did a little corporate job last week for a bingo company. I got that great... Got a great text. Can you come dressed as if you were going to the bingo? I thought, oh, I, I, yes, I saw your tweet. <laughs> I was like, and you couldn't get a shell suit. <laughs> well, well, I said a shell suit. <laughs> yes, I know. I have. I have. You see, one of the things I did in my, um, you know, keep yourself going and whatever, and quite late in my career, so I would have been about the 40 mark, and this was mainly to keep myself busy rather than because I wasn't getting work. 
uh, I did train and spend a year doing two or three afternoons or evenings a week as a bingo caller for Gala Bingo. Oh, that's the same company. I should have spoke to you, but I should mm. know. Yeah. There are lots of... I'm not sure they'll be listening to this, but if you are listening to this, <laughs> ladies of a certain age in Crystal Palace, all the threes, 33. Just five minutes to your national game. Make sure you bought all your cards. <laughs> God. Uh, we have to end it there. Um, all I'll add to that is to... To agree with your interact rather than that, on that day, one of the other actresses I trained with, the sound guy on the on the corporate job, had worked on the, the, the day of TV I did last year. And then I bumped into John Cannon from Head of BBC Casting on the train, but it took me like a few moments for my head to go, who are you? But I luckily I recognised him and said his name before he thought I'd completely lost the plot. But... I just thought this world is so small and it is so about, as you say, turning up, being professional, professional, being proficient, hitting your mark. It is, and being true to yourself and making, you know, and I'm sure there are some people who don't like me and hear my name and go, well, I'm really sorry about that, but um, I, I don't set out to be liked. I set out to do what I do to the best of my ability. And if along the way... I've made some friends or I've gained some respect, then, then that's very gracious of people to do that uh, for me. And, um, you know, I just hope I can help other people now through the Actors' Centre and through what we're doing, get on a firm footing so that when they get into their 40s, their acting career isn't a distant memory and something they tell their children about. It's something they're going out to the front door to do on a daily basis. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you for your time, Paul. My pleasure. Never knew.